we, 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 us, going live. I think, I think, I think we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I guess it would be 6 o'clock in the California area on the West Coast, correct? I think that's sounds, what it is. Sounds about right. Something like that. I don't think I have it all down. And don't ask me about international because I get all messed up then. It's in the early a.m. probably. It's, yeah, it's in the early a.m. or possibly in the late early a.m. Australia. But thank you so much for being here tonight. I thought it would be cool to talk about how when we go to a fish store, what we're looking for. We're not just a fish store, really, whether it's a fish store, a swap, any place where we're going to be getting new fish to add to our fish room, what we're looking for to make sure that the fish are healthy and they're doing great and they're not going to drag a whole bunch of problems into our fish room. So that's the plan tonight. We're going to talk about some of the tips that we use and hopefully share those with you. And if you've got awesome tips that you use, it'll be cool. And you pile those into the chat. So, so glad you're here already. Tester Killdozer, thank you so much for the Super Chat 1305. <laughs> Never seen that before. Thank you. Listening to the stream tonight and doing some tank maintenance on my 75-gallon Severum tank. Well, that's that's a cool. good time. That's a good time, but that's a cool tank. So, yeah, that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, a few things before we get into our topic for tonight. And thing number one is where we're going to be. Uh, we are going to be at Aquashella here at the end of the month, Yay. Aquashella, Dallas. So for those of you who are going, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. If you're going, that would be cool. And if you are going, make sure you stop by, say hello. That's the reason why we go there. So yeah, and it's Aquashellaween is what they're calling <laughs> it because it just happens to fall on Halloween weekend. So that will be fun. And I know people are going to be dressing up. Are we dressing up? Did, did we? We haven't really put any thought into that yet. And I feel like everybody's going to do it. And if we really? show up on Sunday and, no. and not... I think it would be like in the movies where we'd be the only ones dressed up for some reason. No, 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 no. no. People are talking. People are talking are about what they're like going to be. I, I don't know. I but that'd be the majority. I, I've seen a lot of fellow YouTubers talking about costumes and thoughts and really? putting stuff on Instagram. So wow. I almost feel like a little peer pressured into doing something. So we need to think about that. But anyway... That's where we're going to be over Halloween weekend. And then uh, it looks like the OCA is starting to um, come together. So that is in Ohio. It's in Strongsville, Ohio, which is just south of Cleveland. That is November... Hold on. I think it's November 19th through the 21st. I'm almost positive that's what it is. And that's really fun. If you are in the area, if you're in Ohio, Indiana, you know, the central part of the United States, maybe even eastern side or... Anywhere in the world, and you can make it either Central Part, Ohio, Over. Central Part, United States, Eastern Part, or anywhere in the world. If you can make it to Ohio um, in October, no, sorry, November 19th through 21st, again, I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, that's a fun time because not only do they have a lot of talks all weekend, which are really good, uh, that was one of my favorite things about that a couple years ago when I went, and that was the first time I'd ever gone in 2019, is actually being able to sit down and see all the talks, which were, again, excellent. They've got cichlid shows and this catfish bowl show type thing, and a big one too. They've got vendors there. And then the coolest thing is they have people selling fish out of their hotel rooms. It's like a fish swap, but inside a hotel. And they let them do this. They set up, I'm not kidding you, like you walk into these rooms, they've got racks and racks of tanks, and they've got like bins of plants on the bed, and people are now we're talking. And they've got lists right when you walk in right on the doors so you can see what they're selling the doors are open so you just walk right in it's like a billion little stores in this hotel hmm. and it's really cool so it's it's a swap meet meets fish convention meets something else i don't even know but it's a lot of fun so that's our plan for november so that's what we're doing uh videos this week on monday why can't i never it's wednesday and i can never remember what we did on monday wow what did we do you don't know either do you no i'm kind of drawing a blank wow that's how good our memory is these days. Hold on, Monday, Monday. Oh, it was the uh, five things that experienced fish keepers do. So if you haven't checked that out yes, and you want a little fun. bit of insight into what I think a lot of experienced fish keepers do, check out that video. Today on Prime, uh, uh, the, the Smallscape, yeah, on your channel, The Smallscape, you were talking about what? I was talking about 
ways that I like to keep my tanks looking good, specifically nano tanks, looking good throughout the week until the next water change. So a little bit of daily, bi-daily maintenance type of things, yeah. things little things, not not big giant Nothing things to do. Earth shattering. Just you walk by the tank and you do a few things and it, it just makes the tank maintenance day a little bit easier, right? Mm -hmm. So that was on the small scape on your channel today. Tomorrow, members only video, we've got, actually you and I, so it's kind of cool. I went and got some fish from one of our vendors and I brought them home and you had no idea what I got. No, and I so we unboxed them and it's so like you Christmas. got to see them as we were unboxing them. So you'll get to see that tomorrow for the members. And then Friday, I am 99% sure I'm doing a species profile of a fish that is much loved by everybody. <laughs> and Saturday... I know what that is. No, you don't. Uh, maybe I changed Which it. I do. So Saturday, you've got something cool and interesting coming up on the small scape, right? Yes, I do. Awesome. So that is the dealio. That's the dealio. So fish fan 20 gallon long. Thank you so much for the super hey. chat. Just got back from Liberty U homecoming and found a great aquarium store. Bought some rocks and wood for my aquarium. Thanks for the Lucky. encouragement. Well, that's cool. Thank you for being Sweet. here. Appreciate the super chat. Hope all that stuff works out well because it's always fun getting new fish tank decorations. Oh, yes, yep. it is. It's sometimes for experience or for any fish keepers, that can be almost as fun as getting the fish, right? Heck when you yeah, find I sweet can. pieces of driftwood, plants, rocks, like, oh yeah, this is going in a new setup. And it's going to be cool. Mm -hmm. So today we are going to be talking about what we do to try to make sure that the fish that we're bringing into the fish room are going to be healthy. They're going to survive. They're going to thrive in our fish room. And one of the ways to do that is to ensure that we are not bringing in fish that could potentially not only be sick, cost us money because now we brought in sick fish that are no longer with us, but fish that are unhealthy can make your fish that you currently have unhealthy too. So we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So if we're walking into a pet store or a swap or an auction or anywhere where you can buy fish, there are certain things that we do. So thing number one, this is going to sound like duh, but you would be surprised, and myself included sometimes, how sometimes I don't follow this very simple rule. I know. I the guess you know what it is. The very simple rule <laughs> is if you know a store mostly sells unhealthy fish, even if they've got that wonderful fish that you just haven't, you just really want it, try to avoid it because it's just usually going to bring you more problems than it's worth. And so the first thing that we do is we avoid places, and there are some places around us that we don't buy fish from. We might buy other things from them, yeah. but we won't buy fish because, unfortunately, history has taught us a lesson, and that lesson is if, I, if I'm bringing home fish from a certain place and 75% of the time they wind up with ick or some type of parasite or we have really bad luck in terms of the survival rates, Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. Even if they've no. got a fish that I really, really like, I'll take a pass. You need to resist. I need to resist. The resistance. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing, and something we actually touched upon in our video. What was that? Um. Oh, like how they how they act, how they behave. I, like you should probably know what to. Y yes. So do some research, and this is a big one. And again. We're trying to avoid having issues later on. And one of the issues that we can have is bringing in sick fish. Sometimes we don't, if we don't do our research first, it can be difficult when you go to the fish store to determine whether or not the fish are behaving normally. And that is a really big thing to be able to know. Yeah. So do research on the fish that you're thinking about buying before you leave the house. By research, what I mean here, because we're specifically talking about whether or not we're getting healthy fish, is know how they act. Know how they swim in a healthy environment. So you're going to need video, right? Pictures aren't going to do this. Uh, you're going to need video, so go out and look at species profiles, you know, search the little YouTube thing and be like, okay, I'm interested in a blue opaline garami. Let me go ahead and, and type in garami species profiles or something and see if I can find some and see how they're acting. How are they swimming? How do they hold their fins? Are they erect? Are they kind of flopping over naturally? Where do they spend their time? How active are they? I promise you, when you go into a fish store and you know that information, it makes it a lot easier to identify some of the problems that we're going to be talking about here in a few minutes. So know what the fish is supposed to look like. Know what it's how it's supposed to act so that if it's not acting normally, you'll know it when you see it. Hmm. 
right? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you for the encouragement. You're welcome. So I got a couple things here. Uh, thingy number one, as I'm scrolling through here, uh, mm. you uh, all know about this chat situation that freezes on me. Thanks, uh, Shelly. Hold on. Oh, thank you, Shelly. Hold on. Things are skipping. Uh, technical Jackalope, member for two months. I hope to meet you both in <laughs> Dallas. I hope to see you there. Woo-hoo. Again, if you're there and we're there, make sure that uh, you stop by and say hello. Yeah, so we're looking like forward to it. Name tag of like your username. That yeah. would be pretty cool. That actually would be cool. So Don't sometimes, you think yeah, we should have that it, it, at the YouTube booth? Yeah. Like yeah. you guys should have name tags. So That's right. I'm a very technical visual Jackalope. person. I'll be like, oh my gosh, yeah. it's so, you. Thank you so much for being a member for the last two months. Aww. Appreciate it. And so hold on, we're going to need some help with this one. Acutanio? Acu- Acutanio 174. I'm sorry if I'm messing that up. It's been a it's long... Close. Yeah. Well, it's about... I think that's about right. Okay. But I can't guarantee because it's kind of far But you know what? Thank you so much for My being a primetime partner, primate, prime timer. Glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome to our community. So, yeah, the research part, right? We definitely want to be doing our research. The next thing that we need to do now that we've done the research is when we walk into a pet store wherever we're buying our fish observe the tank don't be in a hurry don't feel like you're rushed if someone's asking do you need help do you have any questions blah 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 it's perfectly okay just to say no i'm just looking right now in other words politely no just leave me alone i'm cool uh, and just observe the tanks and and Usually when we go to a local fish store, I'm never in a rush. When I go there, it's like it's not something where I'm like, I gotta go there, I gotta be in and out in 20 or 15, 20 minutes, and then I gotta leave and I got all these things to do. Usually when that happens, that's when I make a bad decision. So when I go there, I wanna be able to have some time to not feel like I need to leave right away and watch the tank. All right, watch not just that tank, but watch the tanks around the pet store. How are they doing? How are the fish doing in general? Right, if I walk into a place and I were to just go, I'm like, okay, I'm looking for black mollies. So I run to the black molly tank. I'm like, oh, I found them. And I'm looking at those. I'm like, okay, I'll pick these five. Well, how do I know that they're going to be healthy? Let me take a quick look at the rest of the store, the rest of the aisle, the tanks surrounding this tank, and see how those fish are doing too. Because if you find out and you look and say, okay, well, you know what? There's 100 tanks here in this fish store, and 25 of them appear to have some pretty sickly looking fish. <laughs> maybe that's a store we just skip, right? Even though that tank is doing okay, you want to be careful and not not only observe the fish that you're buying, but you really do want to take a nice walk around the fish store and take a close look. Do a couple laps and look at the tanks, look at the fish, how are they acting in general, right? Especially if those stores are using sump systems where an entire row or entire rack is sharing the same filtration system because chances are whatever's in one tank can easily spread to others if they're sharing a filtration system. So just kind of keep that in mind. The other thing that you definitely want to consider, ask the employees, ask the store manager or owner or whoever's there, do you quarantine your fish? By the way, quarantining fish for a couple days is wholly and completely pointless for you. For them, it might just weed out some of the weakest of the week. Like, okay, we just brought in 200 neons and over the course of the first two days, 20 of them died. Okay, so those are the really, really, really weak ones. But what happens over the next week or two? Do they get ick? Do they get some kind, do they have some kind of a parasite? Are they just not healthy? Do they have some kind of a, you know, did they get a bad batch? And had they kept them for a couple of weeks, then they brought in that same batch of 100, maybe they would have lost 50 or 60. And unfortunately, when you walk in there after they either don't quarantine them or they're like, oh, yeah, we, we before we saw them, we keep them in a tank for two days. That does nothing. It literally does nothing for you. So that's not a quarantine. The, the really good stores are going to put those fish aside. Some of them have a special quarantine area where it's like, no, 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 we're going to watch these fish for a week or two. Maybe they're going to, you know, premedicate them, which I, I'm not a, I, I generally don't do that, but a fish store is a different situation because they're bringing in fish from all over the place and wholesalers and maybe they got some wild uh, caught stuff. So that, that can introduce different things, but 
they should be quarantining those fish longer than a few days, at least a week or two. I know we've talked about this before. It's going to drive up the cost, right? Yep. And I know it's a it's it's asking a lot, but if you find fish stores that are doing that, those are the ones that you really want to spend some time in. It might cost you a little bit more money, but I promise you this: if you're buying a neon for two bucks, and the store across the street has them for a dollar, and you want to buy twenty of them, it's like, well, I just spent an extra twenty bucks. Yeah, but they quarantine those things for a couple weeks and. They made it through that process and they're looking good, as opposed to the one dollar neons. You go and buy those, and like, oh, that's great. They quarantined them for two days. Now they've got ick, and I've got to go spend twenty dollars on meds, and I'm losing those some of those fish anyway, and I'm losing some of my fish that I had in my tank because I didn't quarantine the fish when I brought them in. I'm paying a little bit more for fish that have been properly quarantined at a pet store, it goes a lot longer than buying meds or having something get introduced into your tank, and you have no idea what it is. So. Those are some of the things. If there, the, the one way that maybe you can still feel somewhat comfortable buying fish if they haven't quarantined them for the proper amount of time is if you can find out how long they've had them, right? So kind of in essence, it's like, okay, a pet store brings in, I don't know, let's say, what, uh, 25 dwarf grommies. Mm -hmm. And you, you find a tank and they've got 10 dwarf grommies, right? So 10 neon blue dwarf grommies. Like, oh, those are looking good. How long, you know, how, do, how, how often do you, or how long do you quarantine? Well, we, we got them, you know, we, we don't generally quarantine. We'll keep them off the side for two or three days. Well, how long have you had these fish in that tank? Oh, they came in two weeks ago. Okay. All right. So what you're telling me is these 10 fish you brought in two weeks ago. Yeah. All right. Well, they're looking pretty good. So... The people who bought the other 10 after the not quarantine period, well, they might have issues, but at least with these 10, you can feel a little bit better about the situation, but still there is no real, um, there's nothing like actually quarantining the fish, that's for sure. All right, so let's just say you're satisfied. The fish in the store look generally pretty decent, right? They do a quarantine, which is pretty cool, and you're walking up to the tank and you're observing that tank. What are we looking for? What are one of the things that you're looking for in a tank? Dead fish. <laughs> That's probably a given, but... Don't buy the dead ones? Definitely don't buy the dead All ones. All right, live stream's over. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. Good and luck. bye. Only buy live fish. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's what you get here. Don't buy the dead fish. But that's a good point. What, all right, so let me ask you this. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Don't you love it when YouTubers do that? And they're doing an interview. So let me, let me ask you this. Well, that's not why you're there to ask questions. No, 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 no. Let me ask you this. So let me ask you this. Go ahead. You ready? Yeah. Anybody sick of me saying that yet? I am. Uh, I, I actually am too. Let's say you walk up to a tank and there are three different types of fish in there. You got, I don't know, stay with the neons. There are some honey grommies and I don't know, some little black mollies and some okay. quarry cats. I'll it's a little party. I'll take them all. Okay. You're interested in the quarry cats. Okay. But you notice there are two dead neons and a dead molly in that tank. Mm -hmm. Quarry cats look pretty good. Okay. Are you buying the quarry cats? No. Why not? I just said because, the quarry cats look pretty good. Oh, I, I'm sure they do, but I don't know. Whatever the other ones died of could have already started in them. So I'm just, I'm not taking the chance. And this is why I marriage you. And then I'm just going to go to the driftwood section and the rock section. And <laughs> spend all the money there. <laughs> Plants, I'll be yep. good. So, yeah, uh, I agree with you. If there's any dead fish in the tank, I generally stay, I, I pretty much stay away from that tank. And I know some people might have a slightly different feeling, like, oh, well, you know, fish are going to die. But yeah, I'm bringing fish into my fish room. I, I don't really want to risk it. So I've developed a self-control. If I see some fish I really want, but they're in a tank and there's a couple dead ones, or even a dead one, or other fish are not acting right, mm -hmm. other than the ones I want, I, I usually skip it. And that goes back to not only dead ones, but are the fish acting normally? And that goes back to the research thing, right? So if you know, okay, I want sailfin mollies, and you look up some videos like, oh, wow, these sailfin mollies are awesome. Look at the males with that big sailfin, and they're all active and, and flaring that fin every once in a while. And now you go to the pet store, and you're like, hmm, hmm. this one, these aren't really acting like that. They look a little stressed out. And what I mean by normally 
is, especially when it comes to some of the live bears, they might do the death wobble where their fins are clamped up and they're kind of doing the shimmy, which probably means they might have been raised overseas in some brackish water and then they just got dumped into some fresh water at a wholesaler. Now they're dumped into the fresh water at the pet store and their organs aren't doing so great and now you buy them and think, okay, well, as soon as I get them in the tank, they're going to be fine. No, they're probably going to die. But uh, So you're looking for the death wobble and the clamped fins. Uh, you're looking for if they're breathing heavily, right? So if their mouth is going like this real fast, I'm like, well, they're not very active. Why are they breathing so heavily? Again, if you're watching the videos of the fish that you want to purchase, you're like, they weren't doing that in any of the videos that I watched. Then <laughs> They're probably not supposed to be doing that, right? So if they're breathing heavily, if they're piping, what does piping mean? Do you know? <laughs> like technically speaking, I don't know how you would describe it. Most people don't, and I ask you because most people don't know what that term means. So it's okay. It's okay that you don't know. Uh, piping in, in fish keeping means that the fish are breathing at the surface where they look like they're gulping air at the surface. But that's why? not a, that's not a normal thing. It, the reason is they're, they're looking for oxygen. Okay. And because the reason of... for that is they're stressed in some way. Either, usually it means that their gills are not functioning properly. Thank you. So that could be something like ick, that could be a bacterial infection, that could be just stress in general, it could be bad water parameters, uh, it could be ammonia burns, it could be nitrite poisoning. So there's a lot of reasons why that could be happening, but the point is it's not supposed to be happening. And I would absolutely stay away from fish that are clamp fins, that are doing the death wobble, that are swimming erratically, mm -hmm. right? So you start to see the fish that are like, oh, I'm kind of losing my balance here, and they look like they're inebriated. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever said that word. Or taking a nap at the bottom of the tank. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Yeah, when they just kind of sink there and you're like, huh, hmm. none of the fish I watched in the videos when I did my research are doing that. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. What else are you looking for? Um, I always look at their eyes. Both of them. Both of them? What yeah. if it's a three-eyed fish? Well, all three of them then. Wouldn't that be cool? But if it's an anablep, then I'm looking at the top of the tank or down. I, I will say this. If I ever find a true three-eyed fish... Everything I just said is out the window. I'm, I'm buying that it. sucker. I'll put it in a quarantine tank and I'll take my chances because, hey. like, could you imagine? How, how, all right, guys, how, how, you use guys. I've never actually said that before. Hey, use guys. How cool would this be? How cool would it be if you walked into a pet store and you're like, I really want a gold garami. And you saw a gold garami with its normal eyes and a third eye just right here in its forehead and it, like, moved. That would be awesome. Yeah. No. I'd buy that fish. I'm not kidding you. Sure you I'm like, there's no questions. I'm like, there's like 50 dead fish. I'm like, oh, that's probably the three-eyed fish. It's probably got a laser beam on its head. I'll buy it. I'll quarantine it. It's happening. I don't care about any of this other stuff. So if it, this all applies no. to normal fish, not three-eyed fish. <laughs> all right. Wait, hold on. So what, what did you say you were doing? Oh, you were looking at the eyes. Yeah. Why? For, for what? Making sure they're not cloudy. It's not a good thing. Make sure they have them, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a that's a good sign too. But you're right. Uh, cloudy eyes indicate some kind of a disease, mm -hmm. usually. Uh, bad water parameters, certainly stress. That you can the cloudy eye thing can go away if water parameters return back to normal and it's not caused by an acute bacterial infection that is now in the blood. So sometimes and I'm, I'm not talking about when the eye is completely clouded over i'm talking about oh it's a little bit off maybe there's a little cloudy patch still you're gonna have to be really careful still you're gonna have to quarantine that fish like you should with all of them but that one to me might be a little bit easier to deal with than even things like ick so i'm always looking for spots ick is mm -hmm. just for anybody who's ever dealt with it i'm assuming most of you who are experienced fish keepers you've dealt with it before ick is just it's so frustrating. It's so stressful. Even when you catch it early, because you never are 100% certain of the outcome. Right? The earlier you catch it, the better, but it's still so disruptive, right? I mean, if you got it in a quarantine tank, it's not as much, but you get ick in a, in a display tank and you've got plants in there, or, oh my gosh, I've got quarries and logis, so the salt is going to be a problem. I've got plants. I've got fish that are sensitive to heat. Now you're trying to dump the meds in, but you've got invertebrates, so you're left with ick ox, which is a great med, by the way, but it's stressful and you know it's stressful. So white spots for me are a no-go. I don't care if there's any white spots in that tank and it's one of the things I look for the most. If I see ick, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's game it's over. over. I, I just walk away. Yeah. Yep. I think that's probably pretty common. I just break the wrist and walk away. Break the wrist. Break walk the wrist away. and walk away. You think anybody thinks I'm a failure because I'm going to Scarlet Knight? Forget about it. Movie. Don't I, say it. I think it's Starla. 
Starla? Scarla? It's Starla. You think anybody wants a roundhouse kick while I'm wearing these bad boys? Forget about it. That one I didn't mess up. All right, so we got the eyes, we've got the breathing, the piping, the any mucusy white patches on the body. I, that's usually a bad thing too if they're secreting excessive amounts of mucus. That means that something's a little messed up with them. I would definitely stay away from those fish. How, how about fungus? Is that good or bad? Oh, I love fungus. I, when okay. fish bring fungus into the tank, I mean, who, who doesn't want a little bit of fungal infection in their in their life, right? Uh, no. So <laughs> that would be a big no. So like the little hairy kind of growth coming off of the fish. Yeah, that's a big no-no. I'm staying away from that. Um, and then look at the genetics too. Again, this is why the research part is so important because sometimes if you don't, have a really good indication of what a fish should look like you might not catch especially when the fish are smaller you might not catch that little bit of a bent spine mm -hmm. you might not catch that fin that's all jacked up you might not catch that third eye on the forehead either and then so, think what you've missed out on yep so you're looking for those deformities uh, also like fins that are look like they're kind of rotted you could you know look at some could have some fin rot things going on there so i think in combination all of those things that's pretty much what i'm looking at mm -hmm. And that's what you should be looking for as well. So all of that being said, guess what? Even if the fish looks perfect and the tank looked perfect and the pet store did what they were supposed to do, which was, okay, they quarantined for a couple weeks. Awesome. You know what I'm doing? What are we doing? Quarantining. Right in the quarantine tank. Quarantine? The quarantine tank? Quarantine tank they go <laughs> for not one, not two, not three, but four weeks, yes, patience. Have yeah, it. Patience. It really works well. Mm -hmm. Four weeks, they're in that tank. I don't med the tanks. A lot of people ask, do I put meds in the tank? No, because meds create stress. I don't med the fish unless there's a visible sign of disease. All right, so I put them in a quarantine tank for four weeks, but guess what? Let's say a week in, I got a treat for ick because sometimes it can take a while before that pops up. Or I start seeing white stringy poop after a week. I treat that. Once I've treated it successfully, however long that takes, guess what happens? The clock starts over again. And it's four weeks after I've successfully treated that infection. That's how we keep disease out of our main tanks. Mm -hmm. So we, in, of the 80 tanks that we have, we now have nine, let's see here, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 tanks that are set aside for grow out and quarantine. So yeah, that's how we roll. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good night, Sir Jay. Good night. Good night. All right, so let's see here. I'm going to scroll around here. I saw some things coming through. Oh, a big thanks to uh, our moderators. Mary yeah, Page, thank you, Finn thank you. in the house. What? Yeah. I, I saw think... Wendy was here. I did Wendy. see Wendy. Yeah, so hey, thank Wendy. you, thank you for holding down the fort. Delta Charlie member for six months, a half what? a year. A half a that's, year, good job. That's pretty awesome. It is. You know what else that is? Hmm. Six months? Hmm. 5% of a decade. Whatever. That's someone who's been committed to us for 5% of a decade. Thank you so much. At PTA, that's us, Primetime Aquatics. Yeah. Have you ever returned fish that didn't do well after quarantine? Also, did your quarantine period ever fail to identify sick fish? Yes. All right, so uh, the answer to the first question is no. Did I ever return fish that didn't do well in quarantine? Well, I, well, hold on. Yes, if doing not doing well meant that they died, right? So if you have fish that die in quarantine and they're still within the return period and every fish store is different, then sure, I'll return those if I feel it's worth the gas money to do so. The, the truth of the matter is, if, if I buy 50 neons and two or three of them die and I bought them for two bucks a piece and now I've got to, you know, it was basically I lost four bucks or six bucks or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not driving the half hour to the pet store to return those fish and be like, I want three new neons because it's going to take me more time and more money in gas probably than it is just to be like, okay, I lost three neons out of 50. It's fine. Yeah. But there's that, for every person, there's a different threshold, you know, when they're going to want to return. But I've never had a situation where I had to return live fish after quarantine because by that point, they're usually doing pretty good. And if we do all the other things, hopefully they're doing okay. Now, did your quarantine period ever fail to identify sick fish? Actually, uh, yes and no. And I, I think it's more no. And, and the reason why I, I struggle with that question is I actually did a video a long time ago 
where we set up one of our 125s, and the 125, when it was originally set up, was going to be amazing. It's where we have our Vieja now, which are also cool fish, along with the electric Pulacara. That tank, when originally set up, was supposed to house, a half, I, think, I think we had like a half a dozen red spot gold Severums. Mm -hmm. And then we had about, and they were small. We were going to have to fit out the herd. We knew that. I think we had like six or ten, I don't remember exactly, but Geophagus wine milleri. And they were small as well. Okay. So I had both of these fish in separate quarantine tanks. And I had them, by the time I set that tank up, they were probably in their quarantine tanks for six months doing great. They're eating. They're active. They're just being awesome fish, showing great color. Put them on the 125 and proceeded to lose every single one of the Geophagus and all but two of the Severums. That was most likely due to something coming in via the the rocks or the wood that we put in that tank and yeah. probably not a failed quarantine process. So I don't think we've ever had a situation where something got through quarantine and we put it in an established tank and then had an issue. Because mm -hmm. four weeks is a pretty long time. I mean, when I say that, for a lot of people, like, that dude's crazy, man. I'm not doing that for four weeks. Who wants to buy fish and watch them sit in a 10-gallon tank for four weeks before I can put them in my regular tank? I know it stinks, uh, and I know it takes some patience, but four weeks is a long time. Usually that that amount of time is going to allow us to see just about everything. It's going to allow us to see internal parasites and ick and fungus and just weak genetics where the fish are just like, yeah, I think I'm going to tap out here. I'm done, man. I lived a long, healthy, little bitty life, and this is it for little me. Little bitty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why we do the four weeks because it seems kind of extreme, but it's also a good thing. All right, I'm scrolling down here because I saw Liz member for six months as well. Another oh, what? Half a year, Liz? five percent of a decade. Thank you so up, much Liz? for being here. Let's see what we got here. Hi, Joanna and Jason. It's always good to hang out on Water, Water Change, Change Wednesday. Wednesday. Proud Love to be it. a prime timer. Well, we're happy that you're here. Thank you for that. Uh, for all you people doing water changes, <laughs> enjoy it. It can be very relaxing if you just chill out, hang out with us, and. Take some water out of the glass box and put it back in. Oh, Alex is here. Secret history, Alex. What's up? What's up, What's my man? up? Very cool. Glad you're here. All right, let's see here. Uh, Oink Master Supreme Forever. Is that now pea puffers work? Do they have third eye even if hidden? Is that how pea... I don't think so, but pea puffer eyes are really oh, cool because oh, they do move. They're, they're little marble there's the, eyes. You know, that's a great thing that just popped into my brain. What fish, and I'm, you guys can chime in here in the chat, but what fish have really movable eyes? Freshwater fish. Puffers do. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of, I mean, there's other fish where you can tell that there's just more going on in their noggin. That's why a lot of people like cichlids, mm -hmm. because when they look at you, you can just tell they're, they know you're there, right? Yeah, but I'm talking no. about like truly like movable, like, hey, like, hey man, what's going on? And whoops. I haven't watched them long enough to know do they have movable eyes or it's just because they have the multiple yeah, lenses. But I so. that, that's, I don't know. I Just off the top of my head, I'm, I don't really feel like thinking about it too much, but that's why I rely on you to be like, oh, yeah, these have movable eyes. So, yeah. All right, let's see here. Scrolling down because the chat just froze on me. Delta Charlie, thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you for all the fish keeping tips. Well, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Appreciate the super chat. Let's see here. What do we got? Midoriya, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being a member for the last two months. Yay. Do schooling fish regularly reject a fish from the school? Yeah, that can happen. Uh, I don't know about regularly, but it, it, I've seen it many times. So I think a good examples for us would be uh, a lot of the barbs, the bigger, more aggressive barbs will often do that. So tiger barbs are, no are notorious for doing that when they're kept in smaller schools, like let's say 6 to 20 you'll often see them starting to isolate a single fish and then magically that fish dies and then the next one, the next one, the next one until you're left with one. That will also happen with, uh, what else? I just had one in my brain. Uh, oh, my Buenos Aires Tetras were notorious for that as well. Those Buenos Aires Tetras that are so commonly sold at the pet stores, they're pretty pretty aggressive and they were really quite, quite aggressive towards one another. And I think we yeah. started in, with a 75 gallon at the time, this is many, many years ago, I started with 10. You picked those fish up, I sure didn't did. you? Yeah, I remember I sure the did. pet store's not even open anymore. It was a really cool place. Mm -hmm. But you picked out, you're like, oh, I want these. So we put, we got like 10 of them. 
and we put them in a 75 and slowly but surely they just started picking one another off until it's like the group would isolate and then yeah i never really saw them like go hardcore after them, but i know it was happening and they just kept doing that so it can happen sometimes a fish from a school will isolate itself if it's not feeling well and so they may not be picking on it they might not have even like you know told it to go away we don't like you anymore there's no like fish bullying going on but sometimes fish that aren't feeling well they'll go away from the group and just kind of hang out by themselves until unfortunately the end of their life so that that can happen but yes it does happen you just have to identify why is my school too small is the fish sick is it happening repeatedly uh, that can if it's happened repeatedly sometimes it's because the school can actually be too small fish span 20 gallon long thank you for the super chat really appreciate it what if i buy an assortment of fish for my new fishless aquarium do i need to quarantine each fish separately or can i put them in a in my aquarium since it doesn't contain fish yet i hope that's not a dumb, that is not a dumb question no, not. lots of people ask that mm -hmm. and that is what we do so i consider a brand new i consider a brand new tank a quarantine tank and i treat it as such but that what that means for me though is just like you said let's say i have a i don't know it's a 20 gallon tank and i want to go out and buy it's fully cycled right so maybe I've done the used filter media. I had some Fritz Lime 7 in there. I did all the things and I've got registered nitrates. Maybe I've got some plants growing in there. I've gotten some algae to grow in there. It just looks like it's about ready. And so I start lightly stocking it. Maybe I got a honey grammy and a half a dozen small tetras and a few cori caches to get things started. So thing number one, yes, I would, in that scenario, that 20 gallon is the quarantine tank, but I have to treat it as such and that means the equipment that's going into that tank, the gravel vac or water siphon, whatever you're using, the nets, that's exclusive for that tank. And that's really, uh, it, it's an important thing because you can use it as a quarantine tank, but then if you're transferring equipment from that tank to other tanks, it's really not a quarantine tank at that point. You're, you could have the potential to cross-contaminate those other tanks. So yes, that is a good question. We do that all the time. Uh, now, once those fish have gone through that four weeks, or really once those fish are in there, if I'm going to add more fish to that tank, that's when I want the separate one because now you run the risk of, okay, well, those fish were healthy for three weeks. I just went out and bought more. Those ones I'm going to isolate for four weeks from the originals, right? So that's how I'd roll with that. Yeah? What? Alex brought up a good point. What point? Gobies. Gobies. Yes, that's right. The old movable eyeballs mm -hmm. and grammies. Grammies too? Yeah. I've probably seen a pivot. Yeah, but they don't move like this. <laughs> yeah, they kind of move. I mean, most fish have like eyes that kind of do this, but they don't go like this. But like our grumpy gobies, oh my gosh, they're Yeah, those were, were goofy. <sighs> yeah, you're right. Yep, yeah. Ricky, Adorable. thank you so much for the super chat. Sorry I missed last week, but I saw the replay. Well, I'm Sweet. glad you saw the replay, and I'm glad you're here howdy, this howdy, week. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Nice having you here. All right, let's see here. I'm going to scroll around, and I'm going to scroll, and I'm going to scroll some more because the chat likes to freeze on my computer, as you all mm -hmm. know. Liz, thank you for the super chat. Let's see here. Betas at my local fish store are cupped with almond leaves. Do I have to keep them, keep him that way at home, or can I put him in a clear water? How can I tell if he's sick? That's, a, that's a, actually another really good question. So bettas that have been isolated from one another, and there's no cross-contamination with equipment, so they've been kept in that little cup, Generally speaking, I don't recall them having, I've never had a betta bring ick into the tank and I don't recall them ever bringing in other diseases. However, that is not a guarantee, but they are less likely, I shouldn't say that they're less likely. In our experience, they have been less likely to bring in disease to other fish. Um, do you have to keep them in a cup with the almond leaves? No. But normally your quarantine tank, I mean, for a betta, you can do a, a two and a half gallon for a quarantine tank for a betta as long as everything is cycled. You can throw those almond leaves in there if you want to test that water in that cup and take a look and see, okay, what's the water hardness? What is the pH? And see how close that is to what you, what you normally have. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't leave it in the cup. I would still try to give it what it needs in a quarantine tank. Like I said, a single betta for four weeks in a two and a half gallon is perfectly fine where you've got... A filter you've got the the temperature the way it's supposed to be um, 
but the, I, we, don't get me wrong. We still quarantine the bettas for four weeks. And on your wall, when you set up all those betta tanks, the, all those tanks, it was only a betta and a mystery snail. So those yeah. were essentially the mm -hmm. quarantine tank because it was a you new got tank. It. So, yeah. Here's a good question. Okay. Ready? All right. This is from Gawain Duncan. Welcome back, Lady J. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Glad to be back. Uh, if I get fish from store A and more are from B a week later, can I quarantine them, them together or do I need another tank? That's a great question. That's all, that, that's, that's all really good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that we experience all the time. It, yes, you can do that. But understand then, once you add those new fish after a week, the fish that had, you had in there the week earlier, now have to be reset to go through that process for for essentially five weeks, right? Because you are gonna fish A, you had planned on quarantining for four weeks. You are let, let's just say for a lot of people they only have one quarantine tank. It's like oh I got these fish and oh, I couldn't resist and so I know I got fish B a week later. I got to put them in that same quarantine tank. Yes, you can do that, but now two things: one, you leave the fish A open to a potential problem, right? Because now you've added fish that haven't gone through a quarantine. So fish A could have been perfectly healthy and they've been looking good after a week. And now you add fish B into that quarantine tank, you could have a problem where fish B has disease. Now you've potentially wiped out both fish A and fish B. If you add fish B in, now fish B needs to go through four weeks, but fish A now has to go through five weeks before it goes in your main display tank. So within reason, I, I will do that, but just understand that you're always running the risk of introducing disease and you're extending the time for the original fish in that quarantine tank. All right, let's see here. Keith, thank you so much for the super chat. Could I get a three-eyed fish by feeding a regular fish frozen cyclops? Wouldn't that be cool? I think there'd be a lot of three-eyed fish then. <laughs> yeah, if that worked, <laughs> you better believe I'd have an entire fish room full of three-eyed fish just because I think it would be cool. <laughs> Joe, thank you for the super chat. Thank you for all you do for this hobby. You guys are awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate you being here. Appreciate the super chat. Very cool. All right, let's see here. John Wood specifically swaps. Fish are fish already in bags. Won't they be stressed out? Yes. Uh, yes, they will. So the swaps for us, I, I can say this. There has only been one time for us personally, for the swaps that we go to in the auctions and, and the, the club meetings and stuff, there's only been one time where I've actually brought fish home that had a disease that, that struggled to make it through quarantine. For the most part, and this is not true universally, but I tend to buy fish at swaps or especially the local meetings where people have bred those fish. So they grew up in their water. They're really the grow out tanks. They weren't adding fish to those tanks from pet stores because they took their well established parents and they bred and they had babies and those babies went to another tank and there was really no way for them to catch a disease from anything else because there was nothing else that was really they weren't exposed to anything else. So I've had extraordinarily good luck. We've had really good luck getting stuff from our GCCA and our green water swaps and auctions. So that is kind of my thoughts on that. So the, the point is, yeah, they're going to be a little stressed out in the bag, but they tend to come from a place that is going to be much healthier overall. And hopefully if the, if the breeders are concerned about genetics and the quality of their fish because they want repeat customers, you're getting some pretty healthy fish genetically speaking anyway. So, but yeah, they're going to be a little stressed. Hmm. Yep. Okay. So uh, Aquafinity gave Primetime a shout out in his first community post. That means wow. you hit 1K. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Mm. Everybody Congrats. say congratulations. That's Go awesome. Well, channel. thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's really cool. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Delta Charlie, quarantining really tests the patience of a fish keeper. It does. It, it, <laughs> yes, it, it does. does, especially um, newer fish keepers because there's obviously this w desire to want to get that tank looking the way that you want it to look and getting all the fish in there the way you want it to be and when somebody comes along and says ah, wait four weeks wait an entire month trust me in my early fish keeping oh, wow. years i didn't do that and mm -hmm. I, I paid the price i i've and i paid it more than once i was not somebody who learned my lesson the first time around i was somebody where you know and back in the old days i don't really know if quarantining a fish was even really a thing 
but it took me a lot longer to learn that lesson than I would like to admit. All right, it wasn't one of those things where, yep, that happened one time. I just set up a whole wall of quarantine tanks. Nope, it happened like a mm-hmm. bunch of times. And it, yeah, it it's a hard lesson to learn and sometimes it takes a little while. Let's see here. Bradley says, do you need any kind of license to sell and ship your fish? Um, no, it, at least not in the state of Illinois. I, I don't know about nationally. I don't know about all the state laws. But for people who are selling at swaps and auctions, to the best of my knowledge, I, I don't think all of them have a like a business license. We do. Primetime Aquatics is a business uh, it's a LLC, so we have those things. But um, we don't ship fish. But we, yeah, we don't ship fish. But at least uh, in terms of when we buy fish, that's how we're able to buy fish from vendors and how we're able to do that because we are a fully licensed LLC in the state of Illinois. But uh, just if you're going to a swap or auction, people with sun are just, some of them are just people who breed fish. And uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that is required, at least it and maybe it is, I don't know, but um, I don't think it is. All right, let's see here. Mary Page says, let's get the likes up to 200. <laughs> well, that's a that's a big ask, Mary Page, but yeah, show her you can do it. <laughs> Mary Page asks for things. Thumbs up. It's always a good idea just to, that's right. just to do what she asks. All right. <laughs> Lucas, hi, I have a question. If one fish is getting bullied a lot in quarantine tank, do you think I should move the bullies to the main tank, or is it worth getting a whole other tank? It depends on the fish, I suppose, and that's a kind of a tricky one, right? No, I would not move my fish out of quarantine before they're ready because what you could wind up doing is like, okay, I took the bullies out, put them in the main tank, they had a disease, now I've wiped out all the fish in the main tank to save a fish that was in the quarantine, right? So that's the risk that we're running. That's the risk versus reward. If I saw, and again, I'm in a unique situation. I realize that not everybody can be like, oh, I'll just get another quarantine tank. It's like, oh, dude, I've got as many tanks as I can deal with. But remember, a quarantine tank doesn't have to be expensive, right? There are lots of ways to get, to to put fish in a, in a quarantine tank without having to spend a ton of money. I would probably, for us, I would just move some of those fish to a separate quarantine tank, but in no way would I put them in before they're ready to go because I, I just don't want to have the problems with having problems with uh, quarantine. By the way, before I forget, in the description, if you're looking for how we specifically quarantine fish, check out the description. I put that video in there as well as a little bit more in terms of what we look for when we're looking for healthy fish. There are two videos in the description. And the quarantine one, I highly, if, if you haven't seen that one, Check it out. It's It really goes uh, goes through a lot of detail and specifically what we're doing for quarantine. Bonnie, thank you for being here. Thank you for the super chat. Hi, Bonnie. Appreciate it. Uh, hi, Jason and Joanna. Do snails have to be quarantined? Love your channel, and I learned t- uh, so much from both of you. Well, thank you so much. I'm mm-hmm. glad you're here. That's another great question. Do snails have to be quarantined? We don't. I generally don't. Uh, snails tend not to carry the same types of pathogens as fish do. I'm not saying it's impossible that they can't get fish sick. I just, the risk is fairly low. And again, it's a risk versus reward thing. I I generally don't, although I say that and I quarantine the, uh, some of the snails that we got recently. So it's one, if you've got an open, open quarantine tank, why not? Right? I mean, it's not hurting anything. If it's it's already set up and like, oh, I just bought some rasboras and some, and a couple mystery snails. Just chuck them all in the quarantine tank, right? But I generally don't, where issues come in with snails is if they were outside. If that's the case, then yes, I am going to be quarantining snails that would have come from outside. And the reason for that is there are parasites that will do a full loop where they use snails as an intermediate, they use fish, and they will use some type of a mammal. Often it's birds. So, and it's something we used to talk about in my parasitology class. So in that case, yeah, like, like for instance, if we had put mystery snails in our pond this year, mm-hmm. no way am I putting those mystery snails directly in a fish tank. And by the way, I'd also be somewhat careful handling them mm-hmm. because the reason we talk about those parasites and parasitology is because some of them can wind up in human beings. So if the snails were outside, definitely I would quarantine them, but those parasites cannot complete their life cycle if that mammalian species is not part of it. So usually there's at least three 
different organisms that have to complete that life cycle. So, yeah, that's how I roll with that. Mm -hmm. Rocky and Miles. Hello, Primetime Aquatics. I just finished tank cleaning with a plastic <laughs> razor and a turkey baster, thanks to the small scape. Oh, man, you went full small scape ooh, on the ooh. cleaning, huh? Cool. Yeah, I, here's a fun story for you. The other day, I was, I, I think I was doing, maybe it was the members only video where I showed you guys a 75 gallon. Well, there was a little algae on the glass. I'm like, ah, oh, that's not really going to work. So I went looking for your plastic razor blades. Where do you hide those things? Can you share with the group? Because I, I don't couldn't hide find them. them. I had to bust out a regular one, and I don't like using regular ones because they can sometimes scratch the glass, and they're dangerous. I know why you couldn't find them. Same reason that you can't find anything in the refrigerator, in the cabinet. Because you hide them all? No, because it's like right like there. Not in the true. nook, in the nano nook, like right between I two things. I looked in the nano nook. They're right there. I looked everywhere. They weren't there. She's giving me the stuff, but I know they weren't there because I look. And when I look They're, for things, no, I'm very thorough. I keep them in the same spot all the time. Yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Oh. Any Ambuna to stay away from in a peacock Ambuna tank? Any Ambuna to stay away from? Well, it's, so part of it depends on the size of the tank. I think there are some Ambuna that are safer. Uh, that I've mixed before without too many issues. That's the yellow labs, the rusty cichlids, the Pseudotrophia solosi. I've done red zebras before with uh, peacocks without any issues, but the red zebra was a female, or they were females, and they were just they tended to be less aggressive. But I would just stay with the less aggressive in Buna just in general, because the minute you go, hey, I got some Demasoni or some Johanni, or I got, hey, I just put in five male Kenny eye. Well, they're going to kill each other and then probably assert themselves. Oh, ACI would be another one that's pr uh, pretty decent to have with the yeah, peacocks. Really mm -hmm. Yep. Got a nice pretty blue. Um, there was a question. I can't remember who asked it. Was it well, you're a lot of stuff? help. I don't know. Um, have we ever done shopping at uh, Pet Supplies Plus? <sighs> no. You know, I can't I, say... I, I don't know I'd why we way, haven't. In the Wayback Machine I did, for, but that was like for dog stuff. But yeah. like in, in this like century, no. Not in this century, huh? Not you know, in this century, though. Weird. I, I've heard good things yeah. about Pet Supplies Plus. And you would think as much as we're into fish and just going to different places that we would have done that. But I, too, have not been in a Pet Supplies Plus in a long time. I think part of it is there's none really close to our house really. so we have a pet smart and a pet co within i don't know a couple miles yeah and i'm really lazy yeah and so i, like you, I, I get find, really spoiled i find pet smart and pet co bags randomly throughout the house sometimes and by the time we would be able to go to a pet supplies plus there are a couple uh trop aquatics is not far from us mm -hmm. so if i'm going to drive to a pet supplies plus i'd rather go to trop aquatics but i'm actually kind so. of intrigued now I'm actually going to take that as a challenge. Yeah, I think we should. Just, I think we and should I go think, in there. I, I feel think, like uh, we're. Uh, well, I'm going to go, and if you want to come with, that's fine too. No, I don't want to go with you. I'm just going to go. I'm going to go tomorrow <laughs> while you're at work, and then I'm going to ruin it. I'm going to take a video, and I'll be like, here, here's what it looks like. Here's all the stuff they've got, just so I can hope, ruin the whole experience. Okay, since you're okay, uh, making fun of me because I can't find stuff <laughs> that you hide. That's how we roll. See, this <laughs> is how you can subtly. This is how it works. Uh, Alrighty, make then. some, make some. Uh, <laughs> pain here dave from iowa jason always agree with joanna you will be better off thanks dave <sighs> words the of original wisdom super scaper yeah words of wisdom there mm -hmm. you're probably right about that alice b i have two new discus that i added to my main tank they have integrated well but aren't eating how can i get them to eat they aren't being bullied and water conditions are thumbs up well I have two new discus that I added to my main tank. <laughs> How long has it been? So I sometimes am not surprised when it's been a couple days when fish don't eat, especially if they were eating before and they're healthy and they're decent size and they've got a nice belly to them and they're they're acting fine. I don't stress if it's like, okay, the first couple days they are reclusive, they're trying to figure things out. I mean, they're in a new group. They're trying to figure out what the clicks are like, who's talking about who, who's bad mouth and who, right? So they got all these things to worry about as a fish. It's like, are they making fun of me? Do they think my color looks silly? Are they making fun of my top fin? I know I didn't comb it properly, right? So they're a little stressed. If, if it's a day or two, I don't worry about it. If we're starting to get like, okay, it's been three, four, five, six, now we're at a week, 
yeah, then it's a little bit more concerning. To answer your question, give them the greatest food that you can give discus. So usually that means beef heart or maybe frozen blood worms. And I, I'm not a big discus person. I haven't kept them in a very long time. But the main thing is you want to give them the most enticing food that you can because that's the that's the food they're most likely to eat, right? So if I was trying to give them pellets, and I, eh, I'm not doing this. Uh, but blood worms, beef heart for discus, I think they usually like that. So I might try that. J.D. Cichlids. Hi, Jason. As a fellow ball dude, I was wondering how you keep the shine down for the camera. He doesn't. I don't really do anything special. Uh, it just hmm. kind of happens that way. I think part of it's the lighting, right? So the, the lights that we have in here are not directly on me. And then when I'm shooting videos, we have a smaller light that is kind of, it's toned down a little bit. So a lot of it's just the camera and the cameras itself. Um, we run some some decent cameras, so they tend to do a good job of balancing things as long as I don't screw it up in the editing process. <laughs> What's so funny? Oh, <laughs> this is really funny. So TB said, um, we should go to Sandusky, Ohio, because they have a Pet Supplies Plus there. So I think <laughs> we should, and we'll also stop at Callahan Auto Parts yeah. while we're there. Uh, fun story is we will be <laughs> in the Sandusky area, not for a fish-related thing, but... Uh, our youth, our youngling, has a tournament that I'm fairly certain is going to be in the Sandusky area. That's the same one that we played at a couple years ago. Hot We're dog. planning to go back there. So Sweet. We might That's just wind year, up though. at the Pets. Oh, I know. It's not going to be until next I summer. But I the can't point wait that is, long. Well, but, we'll, we'll, but we'll go to that one, too. Yeah. We'll check it out. <laughs> we'll be like, welcome to Sandusky. Woo-hoo. Callahan Auto Parts. Yep. Finn Wiggles, thank you so much for the number one band jumping, man. Oh, Glad you're here. Thanks, thanks for being here. It's awesome to see you in the chat. Whips World, I got to get my rear end back to Trop Aquatics, but I don't get over to Lombard that often. A mm -hmm. road trip is needed in my near future. Yeah. You betcha. It's worth it. Like I said, mm -hmm. when we did the video, um, they've done a lot of work on that place. A lot of work. I I went there back in the in the days when it wasn't in that location, and it looked good back then, and then it kind of, um, it, was, it, was, it was a little rough, and but... The guy who's run the place for the last few years has really done a lot of work there. It, yeah. He's done a lot. And really it shows. Le legit uh, yeah. plants, yeah. too, yeah. now. I Quite like the spread there. there. Yep. Mr. Fish, can I keep a Scarlet Baddis in a three gallon? I was you... just going to read that one. Well, what do you say? I saw a Scarlet Baddis. Um, one in a three gallon. Um, you, I would say you could. You could. Um, I think it would be more more fun for a larger tank because we did have uh, we had a couple in a well, was it, it a, a uh, it was a, it so was, it was a three and a half gallon long yes so that three and a half tank. gallon long was a very different dimension it, it was perfectly appropriate for those fish because mm -hmm. the three and a half gallon long from my recollection was a twenty inch long tank it was as long as a ten gallon mm -hmm. it was obviously a bookshelf tank so it was only what maybe six inches wide and maybe five or six inches tall mm -hmm. but fish especially the baddest are going to use the length anyway so uh, that worked out fine so it depends on the dimensions of that three gallon if it's a cube it for a single yeah it might work you always run the risk of the water parameter changes and scarlet baddest don't do particularly well when things are fluctuating so you just have to keep that in mind they're not extraordinarily active fish, but yeah, I think I like the the five-ish gallon, or you know, like I said, that three and a half gallon long that we had was twenty inches. That was pretty cool. Uh, let's see here. Chimea says, which is most entertaining fish? So if you had to pick one, entertaining, the most entertaining fish. Um, pea puffers would be totally at the top of the list. Entertaining. Um. Well, I mean, the clown loach. Yeah, that one okay, well, came right to my mind. They're I mean, goofy. I'm usually, like, looking for the tiny fish. Um, uh, Oscar. That was going to be my number one. Oscar, for me, is but, the most But I would also add Cory cats. There are Corey a cats whole lot of fun. And, of course, gobies. Gobies yes, yes, yes. are hilarious. Those are, yeah, mm -hmm. I probably would have started rattling off the same fish. So all yep. good ones mm -hmm. for sure. Let's see here. I'm scrolling. All right, Alex, what do you think? I want to know what Alex thinks. Most entertaining? Most entertaining yeah. fish. Go. Maybe he's just like a single neon contemplating life. 
Oh, like a neon that would does. be really weird to have a single yeah, neon. What do you so think sad. he would do? Probably just he sit there just by be himself. Like looking as, for his family. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone? Uh, so, Artie says, does anyone know the alligator snapping turtle? Sure. Seen many. Had them as a kid. Uh, caught them in the creek. Uh, they are not exciting. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> if you want something, well, I mean, you'd need a pond. Uh, if you ever, where were we? We um. The place, the pond guy. Um, what yeah. is that place called? Greg Woodstock, the pond guy. Yeah. So we did a video that would have been 2019 of that pond guy, Aqua Aqualand. Mm -hmm. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think so. Uh, he has a snap alligator snapping turtle in one of his ponds that's massive, and he picked it up and he showed it off. And I think I have it in that video. Alligator snapping turtles. You just straight up need a very large pond. They're not active. That's the other thing too. Is they'll go in there and you'll be like. I think it's in there somewhere, but yeah, it's definitely not something for a fish tank. Uh, there, there's not too many tanks big enough to house one properly long term. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so Jason Peculiar says uh, tiger barb. Tiger barb. Entertaining what? fish. Okay, yeah, in a group for sure. And uh, Finn Wiggle says uh, fantail goldies are so entertaining because they swim into my hands and stare at me from across the room. Uh, Aww, that's pretty so cool. Cute. That's cool. Flower horn, parrotfish. Oh, of course, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Midas cichlids. Well, we still do, we still have Ruby, but Midas cichlids yes, are a lot of the larger. True. So pretty much, mm -hmm. when you start getting into the large South and Central American cichlids, a lot of them can be very entertaining, very personable. Uh, but you just need a large tank, and they have to be willing to, in some cases, have a really large tank dedicated to a single fish. Uh, Kelly D, thank you so much for the super chat with the thummy, with the little thummy. Aww, yay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, scrolling down list. Thank you for the super chat again. Appreciate it. How do I clean a medicated tank or a tank where a fish had ick or mouth fungus or something so future fish mm. don't get sick too? Mm. Okay, so there's a couple ways to look at this. Let's let's take the ick example. I put in a dozen fish in a 10-gallon tank to quarantine for four weeks. After three days, they get ick. I go through the treatment process. I treat the ick successfully. I give them another four weeks to go through the quarantine after the last sign of disease. So maybe they've been in that quarantine tank now at this point for eight weeks. The fish then leave the quarantine tank and go into the regular tank. In that case, I don't do anything with the quarantine tank because if I treated it successfully and now I'm putting those fish that were in quarantine in my regular tank, that tells me I don't really have much to worry about. That also tells me that the disease in that original tank is probably not there anymore. It's been successfully treated. That's how I roll with that. If in scenario number two, I get my dozen fish, I put them in my 10 gallon tank, they get ick, I treat them. So this happened one time with rummy nose tetras. It was the fastest I've ever seen ick happen to a group of fish and go from basically zero to dead in the matter of days. So I get these rummy nose tetras, I think I got like 20 of them. I put them in a tank. I Next day, I notice some spots. I start treating for ick. Within three days, they're all dead. And I mean, they were covered. It just looked like someone just chucked salt over them. I did the heat. I did the, you know, the. I think at that point, I was using a copper safe, which is, that's a, that's a med right there. Uh, so I did all the things, and they all died. In that particular case, I didn't deal with the, the ick. It could still be there. So there's a few things that you can do there. Thing number one is, okay, I removed all the dead fish. At this point, I have no fish in this tank. I can still go through and treat the tank with the heat. So maybe, and now I don't have fish in there, so I can roll, and I've done this before, I can roll 85, 90 degrees in that tank. I can dump twice the amount of ick meds in there as, as normal, and I can put in a tablespoon of salt per one or two gallons. And then I just roll like that for three weeks, and you're probably going to obliterate everything. I did that with my 125 where, and I've told this story many times, that same tank where I had all the geophagus dye and the severums, I waited a while and I put some geophagus brasiliensis in there thinking that, okay, the, whatever was in there affected those fish, I should be fine while well, I lost that group. So what I did in that 125 is exactly what I just explained. Heat went up to almost 90 degrees, dumped in twice the amount of ick meds, and I, in this particular case, because I wasn't, it was some type of bacterial infection. I also dumped in, I think, two or three times the amount of levamisol and a whole bunch of salt. And I left it that way for like three or four weeks. And when it all was said and done, 
I put fish in there, and I've never had a problem in that tank again. Hmm. So you could do that. The other thing that you can do, and this is why uh, the video I did with APET, I think I titled that video the most important fish conversation I've ever had because it was. Uh, the video I did with APET, I talked to Scott, and he is the fish health manager of APET, which is a rather large uh, fish wholesaler. And he advocated for keeping your quarantine tanks bare bottom, using a, a cycled sponge filter, but when the quarantine tank is done, regardless of the outcome of your quarantine, to break that tank down and to go ahead and thoroughly clean the sponge filter. That could mean taking that sponge filter and putting an addition, in a, a washing machine, cleaning it, letting it dry, putting it back into a cycled tank, let it recycle for four to six weeks. Then when you get new fish, you can put that cycled sponge filter back in a brand new, basically quarantine setup. He would empty out the water in a quarantine tank, bleach it down, rinse it, and then just let it dry. Air drying does a lot. There are most fish parasites will not survive a thorough drying process. So that's something to think, keep in mind when you're talking about nets, when you're talking about gravel vac, when you're talking about filtration media. When you thoroughly dry that, and I'm talking about for weeks, and like there's no water, most parasites, will, it's not going to survive that. Most of the bacterial organisms will not survive that. If they produce spores, if some fungi produce spores or bacteria produce um, um, endospores, maybe, but the vast majority of the microbes that would infect fish aren't going to survive that process. So you've got a few different ways to do it. The easiest way is you keep a bare bottom quarantine tank, you break it down, you bleach it, you thoroughly wash the filtration, or if it's a hang back filter, just remove the media. You can rinse out the back of the hang back filter, let it dry, and then it's ready to go next time. Hmm. Okay. Do you want to hear Alex's choices I for do. most entertaining fish. I really do. Okay, this first one, I'm going to totally butcher this one. Um, Schismatio gobius. Schismatio? I don't know. Whatever. Okay. All right. Dragon goby. Yep. Cribs with babies. <laughs> that should be a show. <laughs> well, People some... would be really confused, right? Cribs with babies. Everybody's clicking on it. It's just like these, these, these fish swimming around. That would be a good one. Right? Like MTV, Cribs with babies. <laughs> And then Puffer's hunting three spine sticklebacks or Oscars, which he did a video where one does tricks for him. That's pretty cool. But then he also, wait, I think he added a couple more. Hold on. Oh, Shelly's and Pandaloaches. Yeah, they're great too. Yes, they are. Oh, Shelly's yeah. for sure. For Absolutely. Sure. I'm surprised yeah. that we didn't mention Thanks those for because playing. we've got whole big tanks full of shell dwellers of all different types. And yeah, they're cool. Mm hmm. Let's see. Oink Master Supreme Forever, thank you for the super chat. And we've got stocking option here of. LG Angel. LG, what? LG. Large. Large, thank you. I just, you know, I'm like, LG, what is that? Large Angel, four Corys, two swords, in a 45. Oh, you've got a hex? Mm, lucky. And guppies. First of all, I'm just a 45 gallon hex. I love that. I really miss the hex that I had. It was a 35, yeah. so it wasn't as yeah. big. But I have often said, back in the day, the hexagallon tanks used to be more popular. Like those 35-gallon hexes, you could find those everywhere, like the under gravel filter and all that. But periodically, I see those tanks. And I saw one at a, an auction, and I was really, really close to bidding on it just because it even had the same ugly wood trim, and it was just it was awesome. It was I should have bought that tank just because I wanted it. Uh, but a 45 is even cooler. So, yeah, large angel, four quarries, two swords, and guppies. Large Angel's fine in that 45-gallon hex, so I, that's your centerpiece right there, right? So uh, totally fine. A 45-gallon hex is a pretty tall tank. It's it's definitely sufficient. Cory cats are fine. Um, I'd do more than four. I'd probably do at least a half dozen, six to eight, just because the bigger the group, the goofier they are. So, and you can pick your favorites. You know, you can do pandas, you can do greens, you can do albinos. Uh, the Adolphi quarries are really awesome. Orange lasers are cool. You got a lot of, I mean, even like the Paleotis are fantastic. The Julies, the salt and peppers. You almost, you just can't go wrong with quarry cats, but I would definitely do six to eight at least. Mm. Two sword tails. There we start having to be a little bit cautious. It might work. It, it, in fact, it, it 
there's pr at least a 75% chance it's going to work just fine. And the only reason why I say be cautious is you could potentially run into a situation where full-grown male swords might start to nip at the angel. It's not a guarantee. Lots of people keep them together without problems, but I have definitely seen it happen. Two swords could also fight, especially if it's two males, they probably will fight. If it's a male and a female, your female is going to be harassed by that male uh, to the point where it might not be able to eat and maybe a shortened lifespan. Uh, I might do a male and then just keep an eye on the male with the angel. But the other issue is going to be the guppies. And there's a chance that your sword tail could chase the guppies. Guppies and angels. Next, the guppies and angels. Let's just say your angel is large. And by large, I've had angel fish where veil tails from the top of the dorsal to the bottom of the, the fin was about a foot, right? No joke. And the, the body was at least the size of my hand. An angel that big is capable of eating guppies. So you just have to be careful there, right? Because even a standard angel, I mean, the body can still get massive and they will definitely be capable of eating Probably not the females. That might be a little bit of a stretch, but I could see them eating medium-sized males or smaller. Definitely the fry would go missing. The swords would eat the fry as well. Could it work? Yeah. Do I think the swords might fit nip at the guppies? Probably. Long-term, will the guppies be excessively active for the large angel? Probably. Right? Guppies are really active fish. Personality-wise, they'll most likely get along, except for the whole, you know, eating guppies thing. The issue you might you might have later on is that your angel fish, as they get older, tend to be very chill, and your guppies are going to be maniacs, and so that might stress the angel out a little bit. If I were doing that large angel in a forty-five hex, I would probably look at. If I wanted live bears, I might think about platies. I, I know they're not it quite as, they're not the same, right, in terms of the finage and maybe some of the colors, but they're a little larger, so you don't have to worry about the eating thing. I personally don't find them, especially as they get older, to be as active as guppies. The fry are still going to go missing. I think they're a little less nippy in my experience than the guppies, so I might go that direction if I'm really stuck on a live bear. I would also consider maybe something like what we had for a while in this tank and then what we have downstairs and that is the tiger limia, which can be pretty cool. They get a little bit larger. They're active, but probably not quite as active as guppies. And then the second thing to consider is, okay, maybe I don't want to do a live bear. Maybe what I want to do is some type of a tetra. All right, slightly on the larger side and you'd have to figure out how you want to roll with that because then you could do in a 45 gallon hex, dozens of some type of medium to slightly medium small tetra but those are just some thoughts all right so what you got well i caught something here uh -oh. i think i'm buttoned in here but that's all right all right jason peculiar is chatting with alex okay and i one word caught because you know jason's he's in scotland oh cool totally i didn't know cool. that yeah i have a scottish lock biotope tank with everything collected locally oh. what and then wait i thought i saw somewhere um we started a fishy related channel peculiar aquatics and you're gonna post footage of it soon peculiar aquatics there we go pretty cool i'm gonna check it out because i want to see i want to see that nice yeah Totally. John's in the house. KG Tropicals. Just wanted to say hi to you. Hey, John. Knew I, so you knew I was here. Looking forward to seeing you two in a couple of weeks. We are very much looking forward to seeing you two. Rest up. Yeah, it's going to be a fun time. Well, see, John's great because <laughs> there's not many people that I know that are willing to just be like, we're here. Let's just stay up and talk about random things until 3 o'clock in the morning, knowing that we have to be on our full game by 9 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> and we can do that like three nights in a row and just know that we'll sleep sometime after the aquashella thing so yeah i'm looking forward to that yep rest up because i fully intend to have thoughtful conversations about fish and life until 3 a.m that's going to be cool i look forward to it tell lisa i said hi yeah tell her say what's up what's up hey what's up what's, what's up? up what's up 
Tamara. Oh, and lots of people Tamara, have guessed uh, Napoleon Dynamite, by the oh, way. Oh, good, good, good. I'm the glad that was, reference. yeah. Sorry for that. Awesome. Uh, Tamara, uh, Tamara, Tamara, I'll get it right. It just took me a few times. Tamara says, what would you put in a 37-gallon tank with a beta? It's not a long tank, more high. Yeah, we've got a 37-gallon. 37 gallons are the same length and width as a 20 long or a 29, but yeah, they're very tall tanks. Keep an eye on that beta. Make sure it doesn't get tired. Uh, the best thing to do in a, with a tank that tall with a beta in it is give it some type of... They make... If you're not using real plants in that tank, and that can be a challenge just because getting enough light to the bottom can be a little bit of a challenge, but with that beta, you might want to consider those like little suction cup beta hammocks near the top so it can kind of rest and see if it will utilize those things because that can be a long way if the beta is all the way down to the bottom of those 37s to get back up. Um, so just keep, kind of keep that in mind in terms of 37 with a beta. What would you put in a 37 with a beta? Uh, I think you could do, you got to be careful with the long, if it's a long fin male beta, just gotta be a little careful with the fins. So uh, we've done the so the ember tetras work, the gold tetras have worked. We've actually done white clouds with a beta that have worked out just fine. Uh, knowing that you're gonna have to be near the upper end of the white cloud temperature range and probably a s closer to the bottom level, so you have to meet them somewhere in the middle around 75, 76. Those combinations have all worked. We've done glow light tetras that have worked just fine. And in those tanks we've done, there's not 37 gallons. I've been on the smaller side. Pygmy quarry cats have worked. Any quarry cats for us have worked out well. 37 gallon tank if you're looking for algae control. Uh, bristlenose plecos have worked out fine in that combination. We have had no problems running mystery snails with our bettas uh, for algae control. Most likely if your water parameters are, are fine, otosynclus. But you'd want a big group of those, probably at least 10 to 15 at least. Uh, that works. You could do th crazy things like coolie loaches. Those would probably be just fine. Uh, but mostly the, the open water fish, like I said, some of those tetras I mentioned have been pretty good. Uh, what else? I don't think I would. Oh, we've, you've got green neons in with the betta and that and the farm tank. Those mm -hmm. have worked. They've, yeah. they've worked out well together. Green neons go well with everybody because yeah. they're so nice. Yeah, but again, you always have to be careful because you just never know. Uh, the, the one thing I will say is those combos have worked for us because we feed our fish twice a day and we tend to make sure that the, the fish are, are well fed. And that, to me, that I, I think that helps keep fish from fin nipping, right? Especially those longer fins. But just keep an eye on it. And if, if you start to have an issue, sometimes the betta has to go someplace else. Let's see here. Finn Wiggles, hey, the other Jason is here. Uh, if John's still here, I got a, a <laughs> comment the other day on a, on a YouTube video, and I said, hey, John, and it proceeded to ask this long question. Tell Joanna I said hi. So, yes, it's true, <laughs> even in the comments sections. I, I get called John sometimes. So it's funny because we go to these aquashellas, and a few times somebody will come up to me and talk to me about a video I made and how great the video was and how – you know, the, the video really helped them understand this thing. And I turn around and look at John, like they thought I was talking to you because I never made that video and I didn't have the heart to tell him. And I always joke with John, like someday I'm going to just say something like, oh man, and you'll just be really rude or something like, yeah, so I'm John from KG Tropicals and I'm extremely rude. <laughs> so the person would walk away and be like, you know, I used to like that that guy from KG Tropicals, but he was so mean to me when he went to the thing, but I could never just do that. Just announce that you're going completely saltwater. Yeah, yeah. KG Tropicals is now saltwater. Yeah. I think, and John, bring, I've, I've got the KT Tropicals shirt. I think I still, I have the um, better one. Mm -hmm. and you bring the primetime one. And we got to switch up shirts this, this, uh, yeah. this at Dallas and just see what sure. happens. Just see mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. See if it, we make it even worse. Um, Gawain wants to see uh, a skate off between you and John. You won't learn anything, <laughs> at least on my end. Oh, I want to see that. I'll sign uh, up for that. And, and trust me, that is not. I will lose just because I have no ability whatsoever. You can pile rocks. I can pile rocks yes. with the best of them, but if, if you're not looking for piles of rocks, trust mm -hmm. me, you are. You, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. Trust me, you're you're learning nothing from that one. There was a question earlier. Um, somebody was getting a. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget who asked it. Somebody's getting a um, wants to put a betta in their office tank. It's five gallon. Mm -hmm. Want to know if there's anything else you could put in it? I would only in a five gallon. I would say only a mystery snail. 
and then you're kind of done. But if you bump up to like the eight gallon size, then that's that's the size that we have a couple that have a little crew of their own. We have white clouds in with one beta, and we yeah, have and the glow uh, lights. The glow, glow lights. Tetris. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there you Shannon. go. Shannon says, we are looking forward to meeting you guys at Aquashella in Dallas. Thank you both Yay. for all the great info and both y'all's channels. Well, thank Sweet. you. That's going to be awesome. Can't wait to see you there. Mm -hmm. It's their favorite time of the time, meeting the people. Hmm. Let's see here. Tamara says, but do neons and need long tanks to swim, not high? Your 37 is plenty long. Your 37 inch or 37 gallon is... 30 inches long. That's plenty because it's the same as a 20 long, same as a 29, and lots of people keep neons in those size tanks. So I know it doesn't look as long because it is so tall, but it's a it's plenty long for your your smaller. All the neons, we all the tetras that we mentioned have, would have more than enough space in a 29, and you can keep a nice group of them, at least a dozen or so. Let's see here. We're scrolling. <laughs> Killer Kitty 08. A war of rock arrangements. Yeah. <laughs> right? That That's about what it would be. Although I think you're doing, as far as I know, you're doing an aquascape again. So you did the aquascape oh in Chicago, and now you're going to be doing one in Dallas. Last I heard. We'll see. So don't quote me on it, but I think it's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John, KG Trouble, there's no way you would lose an aquascaping contest against me. <laughs> yes, I would. I, you need to go back and watch some of my earlier videos. I, I actually put videos on my on Primetime Aquatics saying, I improved this tank. That's what it was. It was basically, okay, the tank basically had nothing in it. And I was like, yep, looks a lot better now I did that. that I did this. And I basically got a couple of rocks here, a hmm. couple of rocks there. And I was like, I did it. Looks good. It's hmm. exactly what I wanted. It's embarrassing. And I think they're still up there. I think I don't think I took those videos down, even though nobody watches them. So, yeah, you ever want some entertainment, go watch some of those early videos of me building out the fish room, and you'll be like, what wow. in the heck is he Whoa. doing? He wasn't yeah. kidding. Yeah. Well, tanks don't look anything like they do now. Yeah, you're right about that. All right, let's see. Kelly D, I'm not as awesome at scaping as Joe is. <laughs> I'm not. So don't worry about it. Rogue Sparky, how do I know if I have enough light reaching the bottom of my 37 for my plants? Your plants are okay. Uh, if your plants are not yellowing or dying off and they seem to be holding their own, you probably got enough light. You know, a lot of the beginner plants, you'd be surprised. They don't need tons and tons of light, especially stuff like Anubias. I have been, I've actually been surprised in some cases how little lights we supply to some of the tanks and still have anubias that do well crypts are are usually pretty decent uh in a, in a 37 gallon yeah you do have to have a slightly brighter light relative to the other tanks because they're so tall but a lot of the beginner plants they they do okay so if they're if they're looking okay you've got enough if they're starting to die out or st die back a little bit could be the light valerie i have a 40 gallon stretch hex tank with Molly's stretch hex tank. So it's like, is it shorter? And it's just like, but maybe not as tall? I don't know. Or is it really, really long? Really tall, but not as wide. Still, interesting, with Molly's, Platy's, and Corey's. I'm thinking to get a Paradise Grammy or two for my mm. centerpiece fish thoughts. They can be a little aggressive. Um, the other thing, too, to think about is where are you at temperature-wise because those paradise fish tend to be cooler water fish. They often thrive best in an unheated tank where the platys and maybe your quarries and mollies are already kicking at. You know, if they're in the upper 70s, it might be a little warm for the paradise fish. Uh, they can be a little bit aggressive, so you just have to consider that, especially with your platys. Uh, mollies sometimes will be like, yeah, dude, we're going to go if you want to, but uh, the platys might get bullied a little bit. But what I always say, if you want to try something out, Make sure you've got the backup plan. Let's see here. Lamb, oh my goodness, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Nothing to say, thank but you. just the super chat. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. Killer Kitty 08, thank you so much for the sticker, the kitty sticker. Really appreciate Lamb's it. Comment. Oh, I see Lamb's comment. Love the small scape channel. Awesome ideas and love the ideas Aww. for awesome better environments. Well, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. it. Glad you're Go here. Go nano tanks. Yeah. Woohoo! Team nano tanks. Yeah. Shy. This is so hard for me to say. 
shy, savage cichlids. Hi, primates. Hope everyone is doing well. Thank you very much. Hope you're doing well too. Kill a kitty with that little. Is that a cat? Aw, that's Thank so you cute. So much. What's the thing? Oh, my, he- my, my hero. My hero. My hero. What movie is that from? That's not really. I know. Yeah, that's I know, a very. You know. There's a very right. minute quote. I know what. what I'm right. filled with chagrin. I'm filled. You see, I understand your humor. I went to Stanford. Stanford. Let's see. You got it. Yeah, it's. Very... What was the name of the of the pop? Oh. Um, In that movie. Oh. Um, she throws it on him. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Well, um. Anyway. Oh gosh, you think that's about gonna bother it. me now. Yeah, I know it's gonna bother me too. Soda. It was a soda. Yeah. Uh, vibe. Vibe soda. Vibe soda. That could be something like that. Anyway, you probably won't get the movie quote because we no, really just made a horrible thing of it all. <laughs> Sorry about that. Chase says, "I recently purchased a juvenile flower horn. Currently have a school of Colombian tetras in the tank with him. Will this be a problem as the flower horn grows? Probably. Yeah. Uh, eventually." Um, You've got more of a chance of success because it's young and they're there. Most likely he's going to eventually make a lunch out of them. So, yeah, you might want to move them. Although the other thing, too, with the well, the Colombian Tetris, not Congos. Yeah, they're, they're going to be they're, – they're quick. I suppose that's a good thing, but he will most likely try to make snack foods out of them. What okay. you got? All right, this is from uh... – McCoy, hello from England. Hi. Oh, hello, hello. Good morning. Early morning. Top of the morning Good to night. you. Well, it's not top of the morning yet. So. That was, uh, see, I did a wrong accent. I couldn't even drink my water. Wow. All right. Just stay over there for a minute. All right. Just a quick one. How long does it take Cipricomas to spit their fry after breeding? Long time. Give them about four weeks. Maybe a little bit longer. They. Wow. The cool thing is you'll start to see the actual fry in their in their mouth, like eyes and everything. They spit the fry out really large, and they're the cutest fry I've ever seen in my life because when they spit them out, they're mini adults. They look just like the adults, except they're they're like this big, but they're big. They're some of the larger fry, especially for the size of the fish. They're some of the largest fry that I've seen, but it takes a long time for them to develop. So you're going to see the whole bottom part of their mouth is going to get huge, and they're not going to spit out a lot. Mine generally spit out like three or four at a time, but once they get going... They do get going. All right, we got some guesses in here. Adam Sandler. Yeah, Aww. we're not doing a good job here with no. the whole movie quote on that one. Well, it's a tough uh, movie, too. A yeah. lot of people have Gee, seen Dad, it. Gee, Dad, have you read the directions? It says secure all pots and pans. Oh, wait, here's the other one. Lola? Where oh, are we going? Lola. Yeah. Well, you can get mall traffic. You're going to get mall traffic, yeah. Honey? Honey? Yeah. Honey? Yeah. Honey? I don't think most people have seen that movie. That's the problem. No, I know. Yeah. Do you guys want to know what it is? Hold on. Let's give them one more minute. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. We're scrolling. We'll do a couple more questions. The name of the movie is only two letters. Two letters long. Two. How do they do that? I don't even know how to play that game. Charades. Uh, Delilah's Critter says, I'm so grateful you all are here right now. Came here for a distraction. Well, I'm glad you're here. We'll try to offer you a distraction as best we can. Let's yes. see here. I'm scrolling around. Tell us. Finn Wiggles is like, tell us. All right. E.T. Alice <laughs> suggests, said E.T. RV. RV. It's the RV. movie RV. If you haven't it's, seen it with Robin Williams and who was the... Um, oh, what's her the, name? Um, well, Kristen Chenoweth is in there. I don't and know. the guy who plays uh, uh, Petey, but no. Peta uh, from... Peta from Hunger Games. Yeah. Um, his so name. the movie's RV. It's, and then it's, Jojo. It's family friendly Jojo for the most part, there. and it's yeah. a good movie. Mm-hmm. Check it out. It's worth the hour and a half that you'll yeah, never yeah. get back. Work in progress. I have a 20 gallon high tank with a female bed of four neon tetras, one barb, and an um, uh, al- albino long fin pleco. Would you recommend adding another fish? Yeah, if that were me, I would probably add. So a 20 gallon high, I'd probably add another six t- uh, neons to that group and watch the barb especially if it's a tiger barb with that fe- even with the female betta uh, that tiger barb especially alone sometimes can get a little nippy so keep an eye on the barb if it's a cherry barb maybe you don't have to worry and if it's a cherry barb you'd probably want to add more of those but generally speaking you want to have more than just one barb my concern in a 20 gallon long in a 20 gallon high is 
anything but cherry barbs sometimes can be a problem and sometimes they get too big for a 20 gallon where at least with the neons you can comfortably keep 10 or 12 in that 20 gallon and it's not going to look out of place and that's probably the direction i would go first mm -hmm. yeah you got something no but delta charlie had guessed it <laughs> it yeah is that the movie with the clown yeah the scary clown yeah uh, oh this is a good one down here Degar, Degar's Aquatics. Hope I'm saying that somewhat right. Remember? I'd say Degar's. Old man with yeah. bad eyes. Yeah. Should mollies be kept in fresh or brackish water? That's a great question. They should be kept in whatever water they were bred in. And if you don't know that, that can be a little bit of a problem. Uh, so here's here's what we do. I generally only get mollies at this point from the clubs that we belong to. And the ones I've had the best luck with, we actually, and I, I don't mention this enough, but we've been, we've last couple of years, we've been members of the Chicago Live Bearer Society. They have like their little meetings after the GCCA auctions. And I picked up some mollies from them, like the black mollies that we have in the 50 gallon low boy came from them. And that's fresh water. And they have just gone absolutely nuts. Big health. I mean, you can watch the videos. They're big and they're healthy and they've, they've bred like crazy. They've We've gotten hundreds of babies out of that tank easily, many, many more than that. Uh, but they were bred in Chicago water, fresh water. That's that's where they roll. The brackish side of things come in, uh, and people will put them in brackish water. They do really well there as well, provided that was where they were bred. Where the issue comes in with mollies is it a lot of times when they're bred overseas, they're more or less bred in brackish water, and then they're converted into fresh water through the process of going to the wholesaler and then to the pet store and then to your tank and sometimes they don't do so well. If you don't know where they're coming from, that can be a problem because you don't know necessarily where where they're going to be most comfortable. That being said, you can certainly establish a group in brackish water. You can establish a group in fresh water and as they start to breed, you just keep them in those water parameters. And I've known people who have actually used mollies to cycle saltwater tanks. So they are tolerant. You just have to just be consistent, hopefully, as best you can. All right, let's do two more. Two more, and then we're going to call it a night because people are getting tired, I'm sure. And I'm starting to lose my brain. Let's see. Hmm. Have you ever heard of an Asian stone mini catfish? Asian stone mini catfish. I feel like that goes by many names. I have heard of stone catfish. But okay. the Asian stone part, I don't um, know the Asian part. Let me see. Hera Jordoni or an anchor cat? Show um, me the stonefish. Don't we have, what do we have? Oh, you've got shadow cats in your tank, right? Yeah. I always get those confused. All right. That's Michael says, like I have had a great success breeding panda mollies. Wonderful fish. Yeah, they're really cool. Well, that's a cool fish. Right? Are they really yeah. tiny? Mm, I don't I don't know. Um, uh, Tim had one one time, or some kind of a stone cat that got quite large. Rachel was asking from Phoenix, Arizona. Hey, yeah, Phoenix, Arizona. I, Camelback Mountain. I don't remember here. exactly, but I actually had it in Tim's fish room tour. I, hmm. I thought he called it a stone catfish, but it was big and it was a predator oh. and it didn't really move around a lot. But I don't remember it looking exactly like that though, so I'm not sure. She said they're little nano. They're little nano guys. Okay, then that's not definitely not the same one because the one he had was was Monster. gigantic. Yeah. Yep. Belilah's critters, do you keep any cold water species? All yeah, the stuff that's behind go. us, none of those tanks are heated. So, mm -hmm. yes, to answer your question, we have Neocaridina shrimp, which thrive best at mid to upper 60s. This room, it's warmer than that. But So the Neocaridina are right behind me here. The next tank over here are white clouds, which are cool water fish. The fish over next are, heter are gold heteriander formosa, which are which can be kept in cooler water. We've also done tiger limia, which can be in an unheated tank. To the far left-hand side, we've got the rice fish, which can do decent in cool water. You have paradise fish as a centerpiece for cool water, hill stream loaches. Um, Good have shrimp. I already said Neocaridina. Well, the Caridina as well. So pretty much all the freshwater shrimp for the most part. Mm. Um, Bristlenose plecos will do fine in an unheated tank. There's a whole, there's a bunch. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of fish. Uh, not to mention all of the the fish that are endemic to North America for the most part uh, can also be done in larger larger cooler water tanks. Let's see here. 
Kelly D, what if the requirement is low flow water and there is an oil sl oil slick at the top of your tank? Mm. Um, that can usually be solved with any kind of surface agitation. So that might mean, like for instance, with these tanks over here, we've got the all-in-one heater. And I noticed that was happening in one of them. I don't remember which one exactly. It might have been the one with the hydrogener for most of the golds. I just turned that that nozzle up a little bit so that the water surface was breaking, a little bit more water surface uh, tension. So that's a, a quick way to solve that. You don't necessarily, so even an air stone will, will assist in that to get that oil, that film away. But it could also be the food that you're feeding. Some foods are a little bit more oily than others. So it might just be, okay, I gotta change the food a little bit. And that can sometimes help, but definitely a little bit of surface agitation. So you could still have low flow, but have air stones, right? Because air stones don't create a lot of flow, especially uh, horizontally. So you can have those air stones breaking up the surface of the water and that can go away. So yeah, that's, that's how I sometimes deal with that. Mm -hmm. All right, what do you say? Okay. I'm gonna call it a night because it's about that time. Mm -hmm. We've been rambling on long enough. So we are gonna call it a night. Just wanna say thanks once again to all the moderators, Finn yeah. Wiggles and Mary Page, and Wendy was here earlier. Wendy was here, yeah, we got Dave lot. from Iowa. Yeah. For all that you do, Thank you so much for all the super chats and for all the great questions. I love the questions. There's lots of good ones tonight. Sorry that we missed a lot of them again. We, we do our best, but mm. on a typical live stream night, we're getting between 800 to 1,100 questions in that time. So we try to answer as many as we can. Sometimes you wouldn't I, talk so much. Yeah, I ramble a little bit on some of these questions. But like I said, come back next Wednesday. We will be here to mm. answer questions. and. You guys have a good night, a great week, and hopefully we will see you next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, whatever time it is by you. Have an awesome evening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. All right, let me press the buttons. Uh, press